Okay, hi everyone. Today we are happy to be joined by Fox and Lily. Fox and Lily is an Australian wool company specialized in wool buying, exporting, and early stage processing. And we are joined today by Bella Plunkett Gillen, marketing manager at Fox and Lily. And we also have David Martin with us, trading manager. Hi, Bella and David. Great to have you with me today. Thanks, Anna. Thanks, Anna. Nice to, nice to be here. Yeah. Okay, great. So I want to start just with understanding a little bit about the, the, the two of you and who you are. So can you please tell me who are Bella and who are David? Um, so I'm Bella. So I've been working at Fox and Lily for about four years now. Um, I actually didn't have background in wool before this, but um, really enjoying it, really enjoying the supply chain aspect and really enjoying the production aspect and yeah it's been a lot of fun and uh, what about you david yeah um, i've been at fox and lily now for just over 20 years um i grew up in country victoria in a small town about two hours north of melbourne and yeah i've been in melbourne now for over 20 years and have settled here now and have a, a two-year-old daughter named florence mm, nice and I can see it's a bright daylight over at yours. Here, here in Stockholm, it's uh, dark and winter cold. Just coming into our summer here. And it's been yeah. a bit, um, the weather's been a little erratic the last few weeks. It's yeah. cold and wet one day and, um, and hot the next. Okay. okay. Heating up, which is exciting. Yeah, that's nice. That's nice. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, okay, so then what about Fox and Lily? Can you please tell me a bit the, a little bit about the company? I'm interested to understand both about your trading arm, but also about the wool grower service business that, that you have. Yeah, certainly. Well, firstly, Fox and Lily is a family-owned company owned by the Lily family that's been in operation for over 70 years now. It was founded in 1948, mm -hmm. um, traditionally involved in wool scouring and carbonizing, having its own factories in Australia. These days, we only have a, a share in an open top factory in China. Our Australian operations have closed, unfortunately. But the Fox and Lily side of the business is the trading arm, which does the export, and we still do early stage processing. Fox and Lily Rural is the country services division, which looks after the wool growers um, and is involved in direct the direct buying side of the business from farms or, or selling the farmer's wool at auction. So pr providing a range of um, avenues for the grower to sell their wool. If the two companies are independently run, but they're quite integrated as well, which means that there's like important network connections for our wool growers and also our export companies, companies as well. So when it comes to wool trading, can, can you just tell me a little bit about that? For, for me, it's a, it's a fairly new area. And, mm -hmm. and how does it practically work? Uh, practically, um, the majority of wool in Australia is sold through an open cry auction system. They have mm -hmm. wool sales in Melbourne, Sydney and Fremantle and most weeks of the year. So you have, we will sit in a room, we'll have our buyers in, a, in an auction room with 30 of our competitors bidding on, on each lot of wool. Generally, the role of the trader, I guess, is to collect wool into, collate wool from various farms into parcels that are tight, specific for our clients overseas, being the spinners or top makers. Um, you basically have recipes that you buy towards to, to put a container of wool together that's going to make a certain top or a certain yarn for, for the client. One of the reasons for this interview is really to understand the wool supply chain better and to get a, get a better understanding of what the whole chain looks like. So can you please give me an overview of the different steps within the supply chain? Yeah, certainly. So yeah, there is a lot of stages between the wool leaving the farm gate and ending up in a finished garment in retail. Um, Starting with the wool production on farm, and then as we as we mentioned, uh, the traders or whoever the wool will be bought at auction or, or privately, and collated into parcels for clients, um, which are generally the top makers. So the wool will go from farm into a, a packing facility in Australia, and then the first stage next is scouring. So virtually all wool is scoured, and then that will then proceed onto combing. And then onto 
and the spinners will buy the wool top after it's been combed, turn it into yarn, uh, and then it will go off to the to the knitter or the, the fabric makers, and finally the, gar the garment maker, um, and then eventually the retailer. And so uh, just to give me an idea about the, um, the complexity a little bit, I, I suppose that it can travel through different countries as well. I mean, it starts in Australia. In your, in your case, you have the farms in Australia, right? Where does it normally ship off to after that? Um, generally about 75 to 80% of Australian wool is shipped to China. Mm -hmm. uh, the second biggest market is India, followed by the third biggest is Italy. And then there's smaller markets all around the world. Um, there, in terms of the, the processing and where the facilities are, there are still a few early stage processes in Australia. That's just scouring and carbonizing. There's no top making left in Australia. The majority of that is in China. There is still mills in, um, there's quite a few top making mills in India. There's I think two or three left in, in Italy, there's one in Bulgaria and a few smaller ones in South America. Okay. And then from, from top making on to spinning, again, most of the industry is in China. There's still big industry in India and, and Italy. Let's say that, uh, that there would be a brand that wants to follow the chain of this, uh, of this whole process. Do you think that's even possible to do? Yeah, it's, a, it's as we just sort of touched on, it's quite complex, the supply chain, but it's, mm -hmm. It's a challenge, but certainly achievable. Yeah, we've been working a lot more with brands, um, which traditionally we've never done. Uh, a lot of that came about because we established a Genesis Farm Group, which is certified under the Responsible Wool Standard. With this, we've been connecting with brands and helping them source traceable, sustainable wool through this um, program. Okay. Tell me a little yeah. bit more about that. So uh, does, that, uh, does that only certify the origin of the farm or does it also enable a full visibility of that, um, of that supply chain? So yeah, the RWS is from, certifies from farm to final product. So on farm, they're certified under the responsible wool standard. So that's for animal welfare requirements, land management requirements and social requirements. Uh, at each step of the supply chain, there's a transaction certificate applied for. Yeah. That shows the financial and physical change of ownership. So all the paperwork supports that. And although we might be certified by someone and we're supplying it to someone certified by someone else, they get all that paperwork. Okay. Um, so so the, theory, the paperwork is transferred on, but in theory, and what why we're working with brands more is that to actually get full traceability, they need to kind of we need to be having conversations at both ends of the supply chain. Exactly. Um, and that's what we're trying to aim to do more. Yeah, tell me about that. That's so interesting. Tell me how you work with brands uh, when it comes to achieving traceability and transparency. So, yeah, it's been quite a new process, and I'm sure yeah. Davey can touch on it more because you know, 20 years. Yeah. Tra tra traditionally, we kind of we either sell a greasy wool to a top maker or, or a sell a wool top to a spinner, and that's where we, we stop generally. Um, with the RWS program, it's, it's certainly got us in touch with brands directly who are wanting to get. I guess verification on the farms or more information on the yeah. on the ground. We've had brands come out to Australia and do trips around the country with us to visit farms that have been used in their orders. Um, oh, that's great. From a brand point of view, they kind of need to really dig a bit deeper into their supply chain, get to know their suppliers. Um, yeah. There's often we hear of hurdles in terms of getting this kind of information at different stages, um, which for various reasons that can be just because it's quite complex. Suppliers keeping their information confidential, if that makes sense. Yeah. Uh, but uh, certainly if a brand insists on a traceable product um, and a supplier, they can kind of, with our help, can connect their supply chain. So we've been working um, within existing supply chains. We can recommend uh, top makers or spinners into people's supply chains or work within their existing ones already. Um, and with the RWS program, you can follow the wool pretty much from farm gate all the way through. 
uh, Bella just touched on, there's some improvements to be made. But we've just had a good example this week of an Australian brand, a small Australian brand contacting us. They had bought RWS certified garments in China and mm -hmm. had, through the transaction certificates or the, the trail of transaction certificates were able to trace it back to wool that Fox and Lily had supplied. Mm -hmm. And so now we're able to tell them exactly which farms have been used in their wool. Yeah. Wow, that's amazing. And that's uh, very interesting to hear. Yes, please, Bella, go ahead. I was just going to say on the other end, especially in this discussion, um, what's been really fantastic for us and for our wool producers is that we're starting to learn more about the end of the supply chain and where our orders have ended up and be able to bring that traceability information back to our growers because a lot of the time it just stopped at the farm gate and they wouldn't know anything further than that. So a lot of the feedback we're getting now from growers is that we've never had this type of information. Like that's fantastic. It's amazing to know where our wool's going and it's yeah, been really fabulous in that way as well. Oh, yeah, that's sure. I really like that angle to it because uh, I have always said that one of the reasons to have transparency, one reason for a brand, for example, could be for to tell the story to the consumer about the uh, about the garment where has it been and so forth but of course that what you're saying now is is equally as important that the uh, the, the the first ones the farmers that they also understand where it has ended up is a, is a very good added value as well yeah yeah it's certainly uh, it's a very important part of the program for our business and as yeah. we try and try and grow that traceable story or the RWS story is being able to tell the farmers exactly where the, the wool has gone. We end up, we often try and trace it through to the brand and, and buy garments, for example, to give back to the growers involved. And, mm. Yeah. Is there like a planning element or a time uh, aspect to this as well? Because, uh, or can you actually, it, once the brand is coming to you and telling you like, this is my uh, certification, I want to be able to trace it to which farm, are you able to do that? Or does it need to start earlier? Does the brand need to come very early and say that I want to trace this, this bale of, um, of wool or, or how does that work? Um, well, for example, the, the one, the, the example I mentioned from this week, that wool would have been sold over 12 months ago. Mm. And they've only just come to us now. All the, once we have, um, I guess, our order or reference number that we mm. use to ship the wool, then all the information is readily available in our computer. It's amazing. Computer systems as to what farms have been used. Um, this, for an example, um, for this particular order, for a container of wool, there was twelve farms that went in. Wool from twelve different farms went in to make this particular batch. So it's not like a single farm. It's yeah. Yeah, but you, you are able to get that information without any major problems. Yeah, instantly, yeah. yes. Yeah, and most of the time they're clients of ours, so like wool growing clients of ours, so we have direct contact with them. We have staff members that look after them and visit them a couple of times a year. So um, with, with the integration of the two companies, with the rural services and the export arm, we really are able to connect further down the supply chain and have that those benefits for all parties. Okay. And what is it that is still needed to evolve and to develop, you think, in order to make this a smoother process for, for the brand that wants to achieve this transparency? Um, I think just, you know, I guess with the spinners and knitters, it's, it's complex for them because they're often using wool from all around the world. It's not so easy. Um, but I think more and more you're getting... I think from our end, we're seeing less resistance from that, from that end of the chain to be involved in this kind of thing. In fact, you know, there's, we're getting more, I wouldn't say it's a huge part of our business, but it's certainly growing where we're having that direct connection between us, top maker, the spinner, the knitter, and the garment maker and, and brand. Mm. So it's certainly evolving and I think becoming a bit easier for the brands now than it was say three, four, Five years ago. So I, I suppose that that, um, so when it comes to a certification, if the wool is certified, then this is possible to do. But I, there are also many brands out there today that are buying non-certified wool. Would it also be possible to, to achieve this transparency uh, in that case? Um, it is possible. Uh, yeah, exactly as you touch on, most brands are buying wool that's not certified. So RWS or Genesis would be uh, 5% of our business. So 95% of our business is still 
uncertified. Um, okay. But yes, it is technically you can trace it in a similar fashion. If you can get back to our order number that, or reference that we ship the wool under to the top maker or spinner, then mm -hmm. we can we have the information on the farms that were used in that particular order readily available. Um, without the transaction certificates, you are you know, having a bit of faith in what people are telling you to get back to our our order number. Um, but again, if if people come to us directly or our competitors directly, they can basically do the same process and we can follow the wool all the way through the supply chain quite simply. Okay. But it would re require quite a lot of manual work, both from you and from the brand and from the spinner and, and everyone involved? Not, not so much. It's just um, with these sort of traceable stories, it's once the wool gets to the top maker or the spinner and they're mixing different different orders together to make a product for the brand, then that's where it becomes problematic. But if you're doing special, or I guess, a special order, you can follow one batch the whole way through the chain quite easily. It's just... just quickly to touch upon uh, the risks of the wool supply chain. If you look from an environmental and social perspective, what risks do you see in the wool supply chain? Um, I guess the basic ones are just on, on farm, farm management uh, issues. With, around land use and chemical use. Um, on the processing side, you have the same sort of things with, with chemical use, water use, water pollution. Um, mm -hmm. yeah, I think we've seen on both those counts in the last 10 years, we've seen a vast improvement across the industry in those regards. Um, yeah, and from an environmental on-farm perspective, um, there's definitely a lot of improvement around properly managed grazing lands, um, which is actually ending up to improve soil health and improve um, like watershed and different things like that. So all of it, if it's well managed, um, can be quite positive. Okay. Yeah. And on from a processing side of the, the industry, well, mainly wool scouring, where a lot of the issues have come up in the past. Government regulations, especially in Australia and a lot of countries have improved and, and tightened significantly in recent in recent years. Even in in China there's been a, a massive improvement in the last five five years or so. You'll find most mills in China now have a, a state of the art or a very modern water treatment and waste management plant attached to each mill. Uh, and the other big change I think I've noticed in the last five to ten years is removal of certain hazardous chemicals in the scouring process. Um, mm -hmm. Don't quote me on the names of these chemicals, but they are sort of banned so all, in Europe. So all wool being shipped into Europe, whether it's processed in Australia, India or China, has to meet these requirements. Mm -hmm. um, and they're easily tested. There's a certification called Okitech, which tests for the chemicals used in, in scouring, basically. And that's something that would be re readily available to brands to, if they insisted on, on something like that being as part of their supply chain. Okay. And from a social perspective then, are there any risks? Um, in Australia, we're pretty lucky. There's not as many social risks um, just because it's highly government regulated. Um, we've got a lot of everything for wages, um, working conditions is highly regulated. Um, from an overseas perspective, I'm sure there'd be countries that are probably not as fortunate as us and there might be issues with um, wages or working environments. Um, but yeah. Yeah, because I suppose that's also one aspect of this. Uh, as you achieve more and more transparency as a brand into that full supply chain, there will be a lot of risks or there will be like a new reality almost for you that you have to address and also work actively with. Uh, I think if you know about these issues, if you know about your supply chain, then it's also important that you as a brand actively, proactively, work to yeah. avoid them or to mitigate them. Yeah, and that's all about, like, I, I mean, this can be a bit of a manual process, but it's an important process because people really should know their supply chains and they should be working mm -hmm. with suppliers and preferred suppliers and um, really aligning with people that share their values. Mm. Um, so it may be complex at the end of the day, but I think it is an important step to make. Completely agree.
I completely we're, agree. We're seeing, a, you know, I've noticed a big push in recent years from our clients who are making uh, products or, or selling products at the retail end, asking us to sign all you know, various anti-slavery and these kinds of things, which mm. I imagine are directed at some of the, uh, the countries where the actual garment making is taking place or... Mm. So everyone's certainly very conscious of it and is hopefully driving positive change in the industry. Then uh, if we just look ahead a little bit to the future, what, how do you see the wool industry looking in 10 years' time, let's say? You know, traditionally, wool has mainly been used in, in suiting you know, for, for business. or that, that part of the industry has been in decline for quite some time, I guess, for the casualisation of the the workplace, I guess, um, and with COVID coming along this year, it's accelerated that quite substantially with the, everyone working from home and not requiring a wool suit. But yeah, but yeah, we're definitely seeing an increase um, from customers wanting more traceability on their clothes. Um, we're definitely seeing more demand for natural fibres, which is exciting, mm. and we're seeing circular fashions definitely becoming more of a um, movement as well. Mm. Um, we think that active wear is definitely becoming more popular. I think that would have a lot to do with the casualization. Also, people working from home, um, people getting outside a bit more, doing things like that. Um, I, I think that we're leading towards this, but it's also a bit of a hope. But I think that um, fast fashion is hopefully slowing down and consumers are making more informed decisions, um, purchasing about quality rather than quantity. Um, so I see that happening as well um and hopefully that's where wool ties in nicely yeah, we hope it does we think wool's got a very good story to tell in that, that yeah whole sustainability and life cycle yeah yeah side of things. When to, yeah when it comes to circularity how circular can wool be we have clients and well, friends clients of ours in italy who are doing yeah. it both with cashmere and wool mm -hmm. we're getting old wool jumpers they're breaking it back down into a into a yarn mm -hmm. which is they have machinery that can do that quite, mm. I'd say easily. It's quite slow, but it's quite quite easily. <laughs> and, and then resell the yarn. So, okay. Back to, yeah. Yeah, let's really hope that that's the future and that's where we are heading towards a more transparent supply chain and also more circular products and less uh, fast fashion. I agree with yeah. you, Bella, on that one. Yeah, we, we certainly need people buying wool products, but we'd prefer. Yeah, I guess buying something that's going to last a number of years and a number of uses rather than being thrown out. And... This was very helpful and informative for me. I'm very happy that you uh, have been here with me today. So thank you so much for participating. Yeah, our pleasure. Yeah, thank you.